them available at our Classic Radio Club. If you want to learn more about the Classic Radio Club, check out Classic Radio Club. Com. In this hour, too, we will have the conclusion to the Jack Benny program from 1947. Then we'll tune into a 1946 episode of Danger Dr. Danfield. All that begins after these words. Welcome back to Hour 2 of the WGN Radio Theater. In our last hour, we began listening to the Jack Benny program from December 14, 1947. Jack sprained his ankle. All his gang is with him. Let's hear the conclusion now to the Jack Benny program. (laughs) What was that? He thinks he's better than you are because you've only got one head. Oh, nothing, nothing. How's your ankle? Well, I can't walk on it yet. Say, Mary, did you bring me a present or anything? Yes, Jack. I left it in the living room. Should I bring it in? What is it? A rubber duck. You broke yours last week. (laughs) Oh, yes. Well, it was nice of you to think of me. By the way, how are things in Palm Springs? Oh, I had a wonderful time, Jack. And just before I left, I got this letter from Mama. Oh, a letter from your mother, eh? Well, what does the Martha Graham of Plainfield have to say? (laughs) I'll read it to you. Don, don't throw the shells in my bed. (laughs) Go ahead, Mary, read the letter. Okay. My darling daughter, Mary, I hate to start this letter with bad news. I thought your father was on the wagon, but last week he lost his job as Santa Claus in the local department store. It seems he breathed on a couple of kids and their hair turned gray. (laughs) I knew he could do it. (laughs) However, I am happy to say that your sister, babe, is engaged again. This yeah. time to a very nice man. He's working at the Acme Iron Company as a steam fitter. A steam fitter, huh? Babe had to quit working if the foreman won't allow man and wife on the same job. <laughs> yeah, that's a shame after she bought that new set of wrenches. <laughs> <laughs> when Babe left the Acme Iron Company, they gave her a bonus, and she's using the money to have her teeth straightened. Well, babe's teeth do protrude a little, you know. <laughs> remember, <laughs> remember the last time she almost got married? When the minister said, do you take this man to be your lawful wedded husband, Babe smiled, said, I do, and ripped her veil to shreds. <laughs> oh, yes, I felt so sorry for those big holes in her veil the flies got in. <laughs> <laughs> they invited me to go with them to Niagara Falls on their honeymoon, but it was too expensive for three people, so Babe and I are going alone. <laughs> Mary, it's none of my business, but why doesn't your mother stay home? She has an answer to that. Oh. The reason I'm so anxious to go back to Niagara Falls is because it will bring back those wonderful memories of 1912. Just think, no other woman has gone over in a barrel since then. (laughs) Not only that, your mother did it while the beer was still in it. (laughs) No other news, so we're closed now. Your loving mother, Jersey Joe Livingston. Jersey Joe Livingston. Your mother sure reaches for those gags. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a P.S. Oh, fine. Uh, your sister, babe, just came in crying her eyes out and said the wedding is off. What? Her boyfriend came over and handed her a note that said, we disaffiliate. No. It must be the real thing because it was written in coal dust. Gee, that's a shame. One thing about your mother's letters, they're always so interesting. And... Don, please. Say, Dennis, Dennis, hand me that ashtray, will you? Okay, but Don put some walnut shells in it. Well, empty it. Okay. <laughs> Say, Mary, do you think that... Don, why are there tears in your eyes? I caught my finger in the nutcracker. <laughs> good, good. Gee, I sure wish I could get out of this bed. I'm so uncomfortable. Well, Jack, you've been lying in the same spot all week. Why don't you turn around and put your head at the foot of the bed for a change? That's a good idea. Help me turn around, will you? I'll help you, Jack. Thanks, Don. Ooh. Ooh. Be careful of my foot. Be careful of my sprained ankle. There. There, I'm all right now. Thanks. You're right, Mary. It is more comfortable with my head at this end of the bed. The doctor's here, Mr. Billy. The doctor sent him right in. How do you do? <laughs> now, I'm Dr. Nelson. Somebody called me. I did. It's about Mr. Benny's sprained ankle. Oh, well, I'll examine that at once. Say, this does look bad. Look how swollen it is. My, what an ugly-looking mess. <laughs> doctor, you're looking at my head. My feet are at the other end. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, that's your nose. I thought you had a high instep. <laughs> well, how, how does my ankle look, Doctor? I don't know yet. Pull up your nightie. <laughs> okay. I'll leave the room. You don't have to, Mary. I'm wearing pajamas underneath. Or... <laughs> now, Doctor, uh, examine my ankle. Uh, just a moment while I remove your sock. There. If this little piggy went to market, this little piggy stayed home. This little Doc, piggy had... cut that off. <laughs> Just examine my ankle. Yes, sir. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, fellas. Hey, what do you say, Livy? Hello, Phil. Hey, how do you feel, Jackson? How's the invalid? I'm all right. Oh, Jack, look what Phil brought you. What? Why, Phil, you sentimental son of a gun. Thanks for the flowers. These ain't for you. I thought you had a nurse. <laughs> well, I'll be darned Here I am laid up in bed And he brings flowers for the nurse Well, ain't you got one? No, if I did have a nurse How would you know what she looked like? Look, Jackson, what have I got to lose? If the dame's pretty, I give her the flowers If she's really homely, Don can eat them <laughs> Well, you've certainly got that figured out Hey, well, since you ain't got no nurse, Jackson I think I'll give the flowers to Livy Hey, here you are, Livy Well, thank you Wait a minute, Mary I want this room to look nice Put the flowers in the vase Jack, Phil gave them to me, and I'm going to take them home. You are not. I'm the one who's laid up, so give me those flowers. Okay, okay, here. After all, it's my house, you know, and I... Ow! Doctor, what did you do to my foot? I bit you, you mean old man! Keep out of this. It's none of your business. <laughs> come on. Come on, everybody. Let's get the party started. Phil, put down that bottle. That's to rub on my back. <laughs> huh? Can't you see what it says on the label? For external use only. You're supposed to rub it in your skin. Rub it in my skin? Yes. That sounds like a slow way, but with New Year's Eve three weeks off, maybe I can make it. <laughs> If you rub hard, yeah. Hey, look, Jackson, I gotta run along. I gotta go down to the pool room, rehearse my own show. Well, you rehearse your show in the pool room? Sure, that way I can always pick up my cue. <laughs> Bell. Oh, Harris, you may not be the Bell. prettiest kid that I Bell. ever saw, but Bell. On second thought, don't rub it in. Drink it. <laughs> hey, thanks. So long, Jackson. So long. And hey, now, Mr. Benny. I've got your ankle all taped up, and I'd suggest that you get some rest. Some rest? Okay, doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. I'll see you later. Ha! <laughs> so long, Dennis. I'll run along too, Jack. Okay. I'm sorry I got so mad about the flowers. Ah, oh, that's all right. Then give me a kiss to show me you're not mad. Okay. Pucker up your lips. Mm-hmm. A little more. Mm-hmm. A little more. Mm-hmm. Now, here's your rubber duck. Blow it up. <laughs> My own fault for being such a mean old man. Gee, my toe hurts. Well, I'll run along too, Mr. Benny, and remember what I said. Get some sleep. I will, I will. Uh, would you like me to leave you a sleeping pill? No, no, I'll just tune in to Fred Allen. <laughs> it's quicker that way. <laughs> Goodbye, Doctor. Hey, goodbye. Oh, Rochester. Rochester. Yes, sir. Look, I'm going to try to get a little sleep. I wish you'd read that book to me. That might help. You know, the one you, the one you started yesterday. Oh, yeah. Let me see. Where is it? Here it is right here. Let's see. Where were we? Oh, yes. In this town, there lived a farmer who was disliked by all of his neighbors because he was so greedy. And one day he walked out to the barn and found that his goose had laid a golden egg. Gee. The next day, the farmer went out to the barn and found that his goose had laid another golden egg. Ah. And then the third day, another golden egg. Oh, boy. On the fourth day, the goose... Rochester, a... read something else. I'll never go to sleep. That's too exciting. <laughs> find, find another story, will you? Okay, here's one. Once upon a time, in a great big forest, there lived three bears. A mama bear, a papa bear, and a little baby bear. These three bears had a house in the woods. And in their house, there was three bears. A mama bear, a papa bear, and a little, little baby bear.
The baby bear said someone's been eating my porridge and ate it all up. Rochester, don't read anymore. I'll try to get... Don, are you still here? Why didn't you go home? I can't. I'm sick as a dog. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. And that's the Jack Benny program from December 14th, 1947. Jack and all his gang hope you enjoyed that. You know what, Lisa? We have never played a Danger Dr. Danfield radio show yet on the WGN Radio Theater. So why not do one now? Want right. to? It's, it's a big day. We're playing some <laughs> extra classic radio shows. We are. And what's exciting is his name is Dr. Dan Danfield. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Who, it's Dan very memorable. Danfield. Right? Better than Dr. Dan Dandruff. Mm, I don't know about that. I don't know. You know, some people like dandruff. You never know. Really? Yeah. Not me. No? No. This I, was a I detective. <laughs> <laughs> this was a detective series heard on ABC Radio from 1946 through 1947, although it was heard into the 1950s via syndication. Michael Dunn starred. Now, he was uh, known on other radio shows as Steve Dunn. In fact, he played Sam Spade on CBS Radio, but on this program he goes by the name michael dunn he had lots of aliases mm, hmm. mm, you have to wonder about <laughs> yeah. that he played dr dan danfield a criminal psychologist each episode began with his dictation of a case to his secretary with dramatic sequences interspersed within the narration joanne johnson was danfield's sassy secretary rusty fairfax her butterfield played captain otis and Jane Novello was Danfield's chauffeur. It was produced by Wally Ramsey for Telloway's Radio Productions and written by Ralph Wilkinson. All right, uninterrupted now. Here's a broadcast from December 8th, 1946, called the $100,000 Life Insurance Claim. Here's Michael Dunn in Danger, Dr. Danfield. <laughs> Danger, Dr. Danfield. Our story opens in the small town of Benton, located north of New York City on the Hudson River. Two French-Canadian laborers are digging a ditch in the grounds of a prosperous-looking farm. Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu! Pierre! Hey, Pierre! Oui? What is it, mon ami? Come here! There's something I do not understand. Hey, what is the matter, Jacques? You find uh, some gold, maybe? Ah. Uh, uh. Oh, Mother of Mary. I think perhaps we have found something we are not supposed to help here. Oh, cross yourself, Jacques. Oh. It is the body of a man. Suck what is left of a man. Oh. Come, we should not disturb the grave of the dead. A grave, you say? Do not be a fool, Pierre. Does one bury one's dead in a field behind the house with neither casket nor cross to mark the spot, huh? That I do not think. No? Then what is it you think, mon ami? I think that we will find this is the body of Monsieur Howard Holbrook, who has been reported missing these past months. Come, let us go to the police. Well, it sounds interesting, Mr. Fuller. Go on, please, will you? Well, there isn't a great deal more to tell, Doc. You see, as representative of the Great Eastern Insurance Company, it's my job to check every detail before I recommend to the home office that they pay Mrs. Holbrook the $100,000. A $100,000 is a lot of money. I don't blame you. Still, I don't see that you have any real reason to suspect that Howard Holbrook was murdered. Well, I'm relying mainly on a hunch, Miss Fairfax, and the so far unexplained reason why Holbrook's body was found in a trench behind his former home. You're positive the body was that of Holbrook? Yes, yes. The corpse had, of course, disintegrated beyond recognition. But Mrs. Holbrook identified him by the fact that the third toe of his left foot was missing. Also, there was a watch inscribed with Holbrook's name. Were you able to determine the cause of death? No, there were no marks of violence at all. But still, you think he was murdered, possibly by his wife, in order to collect the insurance? Well, we have definitely established that Holbrook's wife was spending most of the month of June with her sister in Fairfield. But uh, Fairfield is only 50 miles from Benton. Couldn't she have driven back without her sisters knowing about it? Well, from June 6th to June 13th, Mrs. Holbrook was sick in bed with a cold. Her sister and some friends have already testified to that fact. Well, that establishes her alibi rather completely, doesn't it? Well, wait a minute. June 6th. That was a year ago. I thought Howard Holbrook was serving a jail sentence at that time. No, you see, Miss Fairfax, he was given his freedom on June 5th. As you'll remember, Holbrook was sentenced on a charge of embezzlement from the bank of which he was president. Oh, yes, 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 it was quite a scandal. 
He'd been appropriating the bank's funds over a period of years. That's right. He had amassed a small fortune, but all of it was spent fighting the charges against him. So... 